So it's a session which is as much future looking as naval gazing. Um, and I'd be interested to hear some of the, the, the views of the, the people here. Um, I'm Robin Blake, I'm the Executive Director for ICT and Society at um, ICT Qatar. We are hosting this session because within the work that we do at the division, we find it important not just to encourage people to use the technology, but to use it safely. And that's why cyber safety sits within this most important division in ICT Qatar, because this is the people-focused bit of the decision of the organisation. Um, so what I'd like to do is just to go down the panel, ask them to say a couple of words about who they are and what they represent, um, and then we'll we'll start a, a discussion. Okay. So I'm Rob Middlehurst. I'm currently with Etis Salat in the UAE, where I'm responsible for industrial policy and international engagement, institutional engagement. That covers a very wide, very, very wide area, so regulatory policy. And for various sins and previous lives, internet comes under my purview as well. Prior to that, I was the Deputy General Director in Bahrain of the TRA. And a couple of years ago, we held a similar event in Bahrain. And this is very good to see some continuity within the region, some development within the region, of how the Middle East is really moving forward on this agenda. Um, I'm Naila Hamdi. I'm a professor of journalism and mass communication at the American University in Cairo, Egypt. Um, I'm going to probably have comments that are a little different from my colleagues because I'm not from industry, but I look at the internet as a medium and mostly for its content. And I've dealt with a lot of these issues that we're talking about um, through teaching my students and through research. So. I hope I can add a little different perspective here. Thank you. My name is Jeffrey Avina. I'm from Microsoft. I represent uh, citizenship community affairs for the Middle East and Africa, covering 79 countries. Uh, I've been doing this job for about three and a half years. Strong focus, uh, certainly in the Middle East, certainly after the Arab Spring. A lot of time in Egypt, a lot of time in Tunisia. Um, before this job, I was actually the Director of Global Operations for the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. So a bit of a macro policy approach to internet safety and security, and I look forward to working with all of you in this discussion. Thank you. Uh, my name is Father Lanizi. I'm uh, the chairman of the uh, newly established uh, internet, uh, the Qatar Internet Society. Um, we just launched uh, our society last week. so. Uh, uh, having 200 uh, new members within a week, that was very uh, uh, impressive. So, uh, it, it shows the interest and the, um, um, the appreciation of uh, you know, such an initiative. So um, I've worked across the IT industry in different uh, sectors, in the oil and gas and the banking sector and the IT services. So uh, I come with a strong uh, technical background um, and now um, leading this uh, internet society here in Qatar, it's, uh, um, it's a very important uh, um, uh, role that uh, I think will add value to the whole community. Thank you. Um, we want to ask you all to, to join in this conversation. So as we go, I will occasionally turn around and, and look for hands, um, look for any shows of uh, wanting to ask questions and we'll be taking any tweets that come in uh, and trying to resolve those. But it seems to me that our discussions often focus around two key issues, the technology and the people, about the marketplace and about society, about economy and about culture. And I think that although our discussion will ramble around this landscape, I think we, we will, you will probably have recognized within the panel here those people who may have a particular view around technology, but others who may have a view around society and the impact about freedom of expression and, and, and so on. Um, so I, I'm going to open with a, a big question, and I'd like each of the panelists to, to think about what they see as the biggest challenges that we face at the moment and, and likely to face going forward around the issue of online safety. And you can take that any way you like. It's an open question. You can look at it in terms of technology, or you can look at it in terms of society. And let's just see where we go. Um, we'll, we'll start at this end and, and waft down, Rob. OK. It is a big question. And as, as a network provider in 17 countries, we're looking at our next rollout of evolution of technologies. 
And it's very easy to think, oh, we go to LTE, LTE Advanced, super high-speed wireless technologies. But there's many, many pitfalls that go with it, not just from a technology side, but from a community side, from an access side. We've heard over the last day and a half about younger and younger people having access to iPhones, having access to tablet um, technologies and things. And when you've got countries now starting actively to develop alternatives to, say, the iPad or the BlackBerry uh, playbook and things of this nature, so proprietary in-country developments, that'll make a mass market available which isn't available today. It'll bring the prices down dramatically. It'll make accessibility much, much wider than it is today at a price that is much more affordable. That drives a number of different things. From a technology perspective, we've got to build networks capable of supporting that. And there's a whole raft of problems that sit with that. But from an online safety perspective, it means that our children today, who may steal their brother or sister's iPad or iPod or whatever, and access the internet, will probably have those devices themselves. Technology-wise, we're all very comfortable, the majority of us are very comfortable with the concept of putting parental controls onto a computer. There are softwares in the computer that allow that to happen. Some of us are comfortable about putting it in the routers at home and controlling the Wi-Fi access level. Very few of us are competent or confident about controlling the access devices themselves, the small ones, the iPhones, the Blackberries, etc., and making those really safe. As you move into a world of billions of online collected devices with people as young as three, four, five, six being connected, the paradigm changes again. It's no longer just us dealing with early pre-teens into the, the teens and 20s. It's about dealing with preschool children as well. It's about getting that education done properly. It's about taking the messages down into a very, very formative stage of education. It's about making parents really aware of what they're giving them the power and the danger. And I think it was John mentioned earlier, you know, two extra grades in the exams as a consequence of online availability. Translate that to a world, starting at the age of three or four with an online thing. And all of a sudden, you've got a much better wealth of knowledge that's developing. You've got better entrepreneurs coming and everything else. So you've got a real mix that's coming into it. But unless we can address those educational issues at the very bottom end of it in terms of age, we're going to have a major problem which we're going to have to deal with. As a network provider, we have a conundrum. One, we want to build pipes, we want to give access to people, we want to get that revenue in. But we also have a corporate social responsibility side of it that says, I've now given that device, I've made it available to you. Am I responsible for what goes across it? Do I control the content? Probably not. Do I control access to content? Is that my role? And there's this sort of schizophrenic role at the moment where it's not clear. And there is a profit motive and there's a corporate social responsibility motive that have to be balanced very carefully together to ensure that we get it right. So that's a, a case of pipe work meets content and technology is now having an impact and then the, 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 there is the content that's carried on it and how, how that will interface. And that probably is a, an hour-long discussion. Oh, it's a long discussion. In itself. <laughs> Nina, what do you, yeah, what's well, your take? Yeah, I can actually add to that from my perspective. And, of course, when the Internet first became accessible um, to the public in Egypt, you know, I, that was about the beginning of my career as an academic. So, you know, it was really about freedom, freedom of expression, the ability to disseminate information, you know, access that we never had ever dreamed of before. And I didn't... Uh, so much focus on the negative sides and you know when people would talk about internet addiction or anything else i just sort of ignored it um but i've since changed um uh, at the meantime i think that also because i can talk about a country where the internet has now gained extra credibility or very enhanced credibility it's really difficult now, at this point in, in, our, in Egypt, to say to people, okay, well, stop. You know, there could be some safety issues, there could be other issues to look at, because everybody's just so, you know, we had the Facebook revolution. And um, I, I've noticed these problems while teaching um, in the last few years, and I wasn't really sure how to approach um, approach the pro, uh, you know the sort of negative sides or the protection type issues um, because academics are just left on their own to 
find their own answers. And um, we have no, our, our kids are not media literate or digitally literate, and they pick, learn that in college. So you're getting um, 18, 19 year olds, 20 year olds who can't understand what that message is about. They can't tell the difference between rumor or, or reality. They don't know how to address people who for, uh, want to discuss uh, elements concerning religion or any of the issues that they're very uh, kind of not open to. So, you know, we, uh, it has been something difficult to deal with. And the way I've tried to work with this is um, use the same kind of ethical guidelines for offline, if you will, uh, for online, because I keep saying it's the same thing. Um, and also for that generation, offline and online are the same thing. So that's uh, one issue. And that kind, and from there, that covers all the kinds of content. And I don't deal so much with things like offenders or sexual abuse or stuff like that, but I deal with, for example, violent images. And I was so happy that someone in the audience brought, out, brought that up, he's gone now. And that hasn't really come up at all at this conference, but one of the things I think is a real problem is the kind of graphic, Im violent images that young people, even adults, are exposed to that never were in the past, for example. And you know, how is that gonna affect the upcoming generations? Are they, are they gonna get desensitized? You know, I still cringe when I see particularly citizen journalism, and you see real bodies of people who have been tortured by the police. I can't look, it's, I didn't grow up watching this. Although I, I was a journalist, but we had limits to what we could broadcast before. But I'm thinking, you know, most uh, kids now at three and four, and starting three, have access. And how is that going to affect them? Is it going to desynthesize them? Are they going to feel that it's very normal to walk down the street and find uh, uh, dead bodies and tear gassed human beings and so forth? I don't know. I mean, these are things that we, we, uh, we have to address. I mean, there's a whole lot of issues that have, have come up during the conference but many others that haven't. And I would say that's one of them and we should really be thinking about that to add that to our future strategies or policies. Or Can I just touch on something we spoke about it yesterday? Um, it's difficult to untangle, you talked about the Facebook revolution. I think it's difficult to untangle the Facebook from the revolution and, yeah, and what very. impact that will have on society and people. But I, you, you gave me a good insight on to how your ch students are behaving now, having been through that period in their life, yeah. compared to what they were like before. Yeah. How is it impacting on their well, behaviors? Well, what it's done, and that's why I kind of uh, touched upon that by saying it sort of enhanced the credibility to an extreme. And so they feel very empowered, which is a good thing, If, but it's gone overboard, you know, it's, you know, we, can do anything we like, behave any way we like, because we can use Facebook to do that. And you know, we're the Facebook uh, generation, we're the Facebook revolutionaries, if you will. And I think that that, that is going overboard. I mean, is that what you're... I think that, that's fascinating. Yeah. I think maybe it's something we'll pick up on the audience later, the, those immediate and significant changes in the way people behave Encouraged perhaps by technology, encouraged by politics, I don't know. It's difficult to know. Combination. Yeah. Jeffrey, what do you see as our biggest challenges? Well, I think, that, I think that our biggest challenge, first of all, let's acknowledge what was said by the first panelist. The fact is the internet has brought many great things. I mean, and let's use Egypt as a case of a demonstration of how it's empowered people to do great things. So we all agree with that. Uh, we also recognize what the problem is. And we recognize that this is a global problem it has regional implications, which is what we were talking about, but the actual impact is local, it's family level. So my concern is to figure out how we can do something more together. And what I mean about this is that now we know it's lo global, now we know it has regional impacts, but we need to keep identifying local heroes and get them engaged in this to make this be their issue. 
Last week, maybe it was last week, maybe it was even this week, was Internet Safety Day in Europe. Every time I see this, I feel so bad because I've been here three and a half years and I'm no closer to organizing an Internet Safety Day in the Arab region. So we have all these great things we're doing individually, but as I listen to the audience, I realize that some of us don't even know the great things that are happening in the different countries. This for me is worrisome. It's not necessarily uh, completely deadly because we can get over this. So I think part of one of the first things we need to do is think about what would be a pan-Arab movement on internet safety and security. And it's not such a big thing to organize, frankly. It's not that hard because there's so much that's already been done. Uh, I would say, if I think about this uh, in, in a broader way, if you start thinking about all that's been developed already, and, and there's, there's pages of it, there's lots of Arab, Arabic content. We're, I'm going to talk about this later on in the discussion. Uh, you take advantage of social media, as was just being discussed, using this as a new mechanism of outreach. Frankly, it's not a new mechanism. This is where most of the threat is. The threat is on social media, but now, we're, now we are understanding what it is in its positive and negative. It's a beautiful opportunity for us. And the one that I'm most interested in, although I'm not sure how to do it, and you mentioned it, Professor, you take empowered people, but you give them a task which is actually socially valuable. Okay, it's socially valuable to change an inappropriate regime, but now how do you take that energy and sustain it into a livelihood which will promote change on a constant basis, promoting a more effective society? And as I think about that, I think about what would be the levels of this work. Now, on the one hand, we need organizations like ICT Qatar and other organizations in other countries to drive this in a cross-regional format. We need uniform policies across this region. I was speaking yesterday with, uh, with a representative from Amman at the ITU conference. They don't have a policy on, 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 uh, on, uh, on intellectual property, for example, in that country. Well, maybe it doesn't have to be that different from the one that would exist here. What I'm suggesting is that the first step is establish that macro policy framework that everyone agrees on. Everyone can have a role in this function. Uh, at the cross, at, I say at a cross-sectoral level, at a national level, we're talking about it right now. ICT Qatar as a leader, uh, having civil society engagement, uh, that means families, that means teachers, that means youth. I have a special role for academics, which I want to talk about a little bit later, because I really think academics have a CSR obligation as well. Who else has the time to research as much as they do? What do you do with those findings? How do we make sure that that information is put in the hands of government, but also of the private sector, to use it more effectively to drive us in a more effective manner? I think that uh, what I would love to see, and, I, and we'll get to this, is a pan-Arab portal on internet safety and security. One already exists in Egypt. I know that Microsoft is working with, uh, with the MCIT, the local ministry, to develop one. It's, it's their portal. It's full of content. What's wrong with looking at that portal and then localizing it to local content under the control of local authorities, but at least having some similarity in content? This is what's happening in Latin America. It happens in other, in other regions of the world, Europe certainly, where they share and therefore don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. Just as a small anecdote, since I sit above citizenship officers in different countries in our region, I can't tell you how many times I get a request, do we have any material on internet safety and security in Arabic? And I just finally organized, I said, look, I found the best champion I had in the region. I said, she is now in charge of ISS. So every time I get a question, it goes right to the specific person. Uh, and she manages this force. So in, in essence, I forced collaboration within Microsoft, who was also siloed without this knowledge. We know that these same silos exist within governments. And therefore, I'm just suggesting there might be a way that we can break this through. Uh, research. I mentioned slightly, it's very important. Microsoft actually does a lot of research. I'm sure that Kim and Jacqueline will talk about it on cyberbullying, et cetera. I think it's our, our prerogative to go in and look at this research that's done by companies, that's done by academics, and then pull the best of this into this kind of a site so it becomes some type of, a, uh, of a enriched localization. Uh, on the Arabic content, I mentioned it slightly already, but I heard someone in the last session say, we need more Arabic content. The first question should be, what do we already have in Arabic content that you don't know? because there is a lot. So the first step is, let's get a list of what exists in Arabic. And that's the easiest big win you can give to the different uh, uh, ICT uh, organizations in each country. Ask them, what do you have? And let them show what they have and bring it together and you will find a fair amount. Next question, what more do we need? But if you don't start with what you have, then we're really not moving the ball very far. Um, I, I think that for me, that's one of the main things that I've, that I've been most concerned about. I'm going to end on saying, okay, we've talked about, uh, we haven't talked about, but teachers and curricula. How do you leverage teachers and curricula most effectively? 
I think the best way is actually to work with national authorities. I'll give you the case of Morocco. We wanted to do something in Morocco on internet safety and security. My budget in Morocco for ISS was maybe, I don't want to say, but maybe ten dollars or $15,000. So to be creative, what we did was we found out that there was a national program that was designed to develop parent-teachers associations throughout that country. We offered, free of course, everything we do in this area of course is free as all companies, to provide our curricula to those teachers. And that spread throughout the country at a total cost to Microsoft, in this case of $15,000, but at a total benefit to the country of a significant enrichment of the knowledge base of those parents, of those families, and of those teachers. Uh, I'm going to end with this one comment about empowering civil society. I've said it a little bit before, but the point is this. We have new players in this game who don't even know they're in the game. These guys know how to use these tools better than anybody else. These are the people that you want out there telling you what the next threat is. How can you empower those people to be part of your team, part of the ICT Qatar team, youth groups that are out there counter-hacking or whatever it might be, to get them engaged, to make them feel that, you know what, I'm still doing good, and I'm getting empowered by doing good, and one day, by the way, hopefully I'm getting employed by doing good. This is one of the challenges we face in this region. Don't forget that unemployment is a significant driver here. Wouldn't it be great if you could take a social cause like this and drive it into something that's actually helping people have a livelihood, doing good and living well? Thank you, Jeffrey. Fadl, you've got a, a, a unique perspective, given that you are a Qatari and a technologist uh, and a leader. Um, there are things that you'll be seeing in this debate, I think, that are slightly different, because you're looking at it through a different lens, through a different culture. And I know there are challenges that you identify and recognize. What do you see, either at a Qatari level or at, or at a human level, that are some of the big challenges that we're facing in this? Well, I um, just want to comment on Jeffrey's uh, um, uh, speech. I think that there is a lack of uh, coordination on the, uh, in terms of the international, um, um, international coordination regarding some events that promote the online safety. And I think um, you know, part of our role as an internet society is to promote such coordinations. And uh, it's very important for us to uh, connect the community with the experts within the specific areas that are in need of the society, like the online safety. So, um, I mean, uh, we welcome any initiative that we can uh, take together in terms of, you know, uh, doing something on the online safety. So uh, that's uh, an aspect. On the challenge that I see, it's the wave is coming in a very fast uh, way, and I think it's, you know, to have this online safety, we need to, to focus on the three uh, risks that are, uh, you know, are considered in this online safety. The content, the conduct, or the behavior of, uh, of uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the users of the Internet society, of the, sorry, of the uh, Internet itself. Um, uh, and also the, um, um, uh, the content and the contacts. So I think the awareness, those awareness programs that are talked about just, you know, previously, I think they need to consider those uh, and localize them for the, you know, for the local community. Because at the end, what uh, might work for you know um, other countries might not work here. So it's it's just to address the locality of this. And uh, as you mentioned, there are some, you know, regional uh, um, countries who have addressed this and have incorporated this good digital citizenship within their curriculum. And, uh, you know, there are different levels of the maturity for the digital development in each country. And we need to address that. We need to understand where do we stand as, as, a, as a Qatari society. And I think our role is to, uh, you know, uh, to talk to people, to, uh, you know, talk to our uh, members and understand, talk to the, uh, you know, the educational system, the government, the ICT, all of those uh, entities. We need to cooperate because it's, it's a big effort, no matter how many national uh, you know, committees they put, it's, it's a, a society effort. It, it cannot be, you cannot rely on one single entity or one single uh, committee that would undertake all this uh, effort. So I think uh, from our perspective, from the uh, Internet Society, I, I believe there is a, a, a long spectrum of things that we can address in the society. And uh, online safety is one of the top priorities for us. So I think, uh, you know, the next step that we would do as an internet society is 
to talk to the national committee, to talk to the uh, government entities, to address those and try to localize those awareness programs. We have a feeler of what's really happening on the ground, because maybe th there are some gaps between the, you know, the government and the uh, society, and we try to fill this gap. Thank you. So, Nyla wants to jump in, but before, before you do, I'm just giving you forewarning. I'll be coming to the audience in a minute to ask for any comments, yeah. suggestions, or reflections on what's happened, so get your words ready. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to add to um, the gentleman's uh, comments here about the idea of regional um, organizations, because it, it seems to me from this conference and from talking to people that there are a lot of efforts that have already been, have taken place in Egypt, in Qatar, uh, and elsewhere, but there's not really a regional work, and although each country does have its own specifics, but there's also a lot of common um, commonalities there, so uh, I think that would really be a good idea. And the second thing was the idea of working groups that have to be constant, like maybe a national one or, and then a regional one, because obviously, you know, this medium is bringing things so quickly at us that, you know, it's not that you're going to sit there, come up with the legislation and it's over. It's going to have to be dynamic and changing and moving all the time. So. Thank you. You raised something quite interesting there and quite critical, which is the lack of legislation. I use the word lack on purpose. Um, there is plenty of legislation that talks about various aspects of abuse. I use that in a much wider context than online abuse. But we have to recognize, and being a Westerner in an Arabic world, having spent the last 10 years in this part of the world, we have to recognize there are cultural differences and norms that need to be accommodated. And it's very difficult to impose a legislative framework which has been built outside the culture on this particular culture. So you have to be very cognizant of the fact we can't just come and drop something in. It takes time to develop that. And the barriers where it really does take time to develop is, is having people in positions like judges who really understand what's going on, who really understand the consequences of what's happening, and they understand the differences between a normal penal code and Sharia code of law, okay? Because there are subtle differences and they need to be merged together. You then take it down a, a step further and we talk about law enforcement. So you may have some form of legislation put in place, but then you have to have a means of enforcing it. And there's many things we can do to try and enforce it through cultural means, through social means, through education and things of that nature, code of conduct type of things to actually come back and enforce it from the other side, from a, a policing of that law, is again, it's a massive educational step. And it's not something that can be done overnight. I think we have to recognize there is a time that these things take, but we have to make the first steps. And I think several countries have made those first steps. They now need to take it slightly further. And I think that's where some of the regional cooperation will really help it move forward by having these people, these bodies come together to share their knowledge and information, to understand what online enforcement really means, the areas where they should be involved, the areas where they don't necessarily need to be involved, and to develop things that way. So you can take step by step. I think the first steps have been taken, and I think the regionalization of that side of things would be a massive step forward. Thank you. Um, can I I'd seek any comments or questions from the audience before we go on? There's a gentleman up there. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم مصطفى أحمد السيد منسق تكنولوجيا معلومات في مدرسة صلاح الدين الأيوبي أول حاجة يعني أأيد فعلا الكلام اللي اللي تقال من مستر روبرت فعلا في التكنولوجيا بترخص فبتنتشر بسرعة جدا لسه من يومين أرخص كمبيوتر في العالم شركة أكاش عملاء بخمسة وثلاثين دولار يعني ممكن واحد يجيب كمبيوتر بخمسة وعشرين دولار حتى عشان أصحاب شركة هنود في كندا تبرعوا بمئة ألف كمبيوتر يعني صعب جدا حتى تبرع كبير جدا يعني ففعلا هي ما نقدرش نوقفها بس نقدر نقنن أو نقدر ننظم وأستغرب برضو من كلمة مستر روبرت من شوية اللي قالها إن صعب إن عشان الدول مختلفة صعب يكون ليهم حاجة موحدة يعني أظن إحنا حتى الدين نفسه اللي إحنا مختلفين فيه عملنا مؤتمر للتحوّر في الأديان فمش صعب قوي ان نعمل حاجه في التكنولوجيا 
يعني ما اختلفناش في الدين اللي هو الاصل عندنا فنقدر في التكنولوجيا ان احنا نتعاون مش مش صعبه حاجه ثانيه للدكتوره ليلى انا كنت اتكلمت يا دكتور عن الصور البشعه على الانترنت اللي حضرتك ذكرتيها وسالت سؤال ما تجاوبش اللي هو الصور البشعه اللي تيجي على موقع مشبوه ايا كان المحتوى جنسي المحتوى قتل المحتوى واحد دماغه مفصوله حتى للاسف بعض القنوات يعني انا شفت مشهد على قناه واحد راسه بتتفصل يعني على قناه موجود مش مش حتى على الانترنت فكلمه مشبوه اقدر اقدر احددها ازاي اذا كنت في مصر اذا كنت في قطر اذا كنت في امريكا في انجلترا في اي دوله كلمه مشبوه لازم يكون ليها تعريف محدد بالظبط يعني ايه موقع مشبوه وازاي اقدر اجابه انت عارفه في هتبقى في مشكله الكلام للسيد العنزي والمستر جيري هيقدر مثلا عندي حمايه المستهلك وعندي الحريه العامه وحقوق الملكيه الفكريه والخصوصيه اشياء مع بعضها يعني مترابطه جدا وضد بعض يعني انا ممكن اجي اقول حاجه زي مصور صور صوره قبيحه شويه ورفعها على موقع ده حق في ملكيه فكريه لي انا لو هاجمت الموقع بتاعه انا بتعدى على خصوصيه الموقع الناحيه الثانيه هو بيتخطى الحمايه بتاعتي انا لما ابني مثلا الصغير او انا عن نفسي بفتح انا مش عايز اشوف المشهد ده واشوف اول ما بفتح الموقع ولا المشهد فعلا بيصدمني ان المشهد ان انا اشوف يبقى انت كده بتخطاني انا بتخطاني وانا مش عارف اتخطاك مش مفيش حد ان هو يحميني من الناحيه الثانيه نيجي لكلمه كبيره شويه الحريات العامه سوري كان يو كان يو ميك ا كويستشن هو ده ده, ده الفصل ال 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 ازاي اقدر افصل بين حمايه مستخدم او حمايه مستهلك وحريه عامه وحقوق ملكيه وخصوصيه رغم التشابك ده اذا ما كناش هنقعد مع بعض ونطلع بصيغه موحده رغم اختلاف اللغه واختلاف العرق واللي انتم فاهمينه شكرا We're trying to focus on future stuff. We're diving into some very detailed legislative stuff here. Um, if you have a quick comment you want to make, then, then please do. But I'd rather open it up than okay. close it down to a small in issue. Okay. Please do. Well, actually, I was going to respond directly. So if you want to skip it, I can do well, it during a coffee break. Yeah. Um, I, I'd much rather that the conversation was expansive and looked at the bigger picture and what's coming next than pick on a small issue around intellectual property and mm -hmm. but if you if there are general questions about what's coming next and, and I think that just take, the, take one the point. point that I would like to make yeah. which I would agree with uh, uh, Mr. Mustafa um, was his uh, point about legislation and how that some of, so many of these principles are universal so they can be applied regionally mm. and really globally so mm. You know, the, that, that's, that is an important issue. I think one of the themes I'm picking up from the thread of the conversation so far is that there's an awful lot going on, but perhaps we're in our little silos. Perhaps we need to work regionally and ultimately and, globally, and globally on a whole range of things well, from, from just provision of information yeah. through, through common sharing of research, Absolutely. through understanding yeah. that there are common policy implications that need to be looked at, and, and, and ultimately con common regulation. Yeah. There actually yeah. are, there actually are uh, best practices already that exist. I mean, they're best case law practices from within the region. I think you should always work locally. I think you should always use what's here locally available because it does do the best to reflect what's required. It's ridiculous to take something from a completely different region and think it should work here. I mean, I, as a lawyer, I've actually, I've, I've, I've worked in that frame where you try to look at principles, but separate principles from the actual ethic of a specific culture and let that culture's yeah. ethics decide what right. is important here. And frankly speaking, commercially, it's the job of a corporation to understand the ethical dimension in which they choose to work. And they must adjust to that ethical dimension. On the legal side, you raised a really good point. I just want to make it clear that when you're in a, in, in a context where a government is actually interested in this area, you actually can do a lot. I mean, in addition to working on laws, and we actually have done a lot of training of judges and training, training of advocates so they understand how to actually implement laws. But I wanted to say some other, one other point about law, which I think is most important, and again, speaking as a lawyer. The best laws are the, are the laws that people actually are interested in. If you want a law enforced and you will put your own energy into it, that law gets enforced. So again, this is an issue which in my mind, this is why I say global, global cause, local impact. This is something which is impacting your family. I mean, you're right, you can't really fight against this, his right or her right to put something out there, but you can say, look, what is the appropriate behavior that we want to see in our society? And I think that by involving civil society, this is why I'm so happy to be sitting next to you, by involving civil society in that process to assist 
national authorities and subsequently even regional authorities in that process of determining the correct way of monitoring the space as the private sector continues to evolve, that's what's going to create, I hope, I hope this, this, this perfect balance of, of civil society engaged enforcement of the ethical principles that now become in question because of the advances of technology, which we already accept as very positive. So it's this interesting, interactive, proactive debate which will not end, and I think this is one of your points, that this is an evolving discussion. But the first step is making sure that we have champions who are recognized, bringing youth into this discussion, and applauding national authorities when they choose to drive this. I mean, I think Qatar, for example, has taken a lot of leadership positions in terms of foreign affairs. Very clear. This could be another great place to, to step in. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from the front. Um, actually, it's a comment. It's about um, the exchange of best practices and how this was uh, a positive experience in Egypt because when we um, produce our child law um, uh, that included, of course, a very important uh, article on, um, on protection on the Internet, particularly concerning child pornography, we based ourselves on many different uh, best practices from uh, from the West as well as from other Arab countries. So I think the exchange of practices is extremely beneficial. It doesn't mean that we're copying. It means that we take the main uh, points that could fit our context and uh, apply them. There is also, I think, a model uh, legislation. I think it was produced by the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children that could be also a, a very important uh, guide for those countries that are still working on um, a special legislation. The other point I would like to mention is that uh, since 2009, there has been a proposal for an Arab project on child online safety. It has been uh, presented to the League of Arab States and then to the ITU WTDC. Um, for some reason, maybe there is no political will yet to have uh, cooperation, but maybe with more and more awareness in the Arab region, we can revive this project and have something on the ground on the Arab region. Maybe the ITU's particular interest suddenly in child online protection might main, mean the political is beginning to change. Naila. Um, I think that I haven't noticed that there's one group, and very important group, that we have not talked about in this whole debate, and that's the media, um, journalists in particular, media coverage. And um, I, I see the, that, that the awareness of online protection issues and movements toward it are very weak, as at least as far in, as in the media that I read. And um, if you we're going to go through all these efforts, where well, you need to engage them to help raise the public will, and the, therefore the probably, I hope, the political will to bring in these uh, um, higher commitments to online protection. Another comment down on the front. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to take some issue with that last comment about the media and to introduce myself. I mentioned earlier I'm with Connect Safely, but I also am a commentator for CBS News, BBC World Service, and Al Jazeera, so I'm very part of the media. In fact, at least in the United States, there was a great deal of media attention to online safety around 2004 to 2006, but it was entirely misguided. It was all about the hysteria around predators and the, the false notion that children were at grave risk of being sexually molested uh, every time they went on the internet. And there was a huge amount of media exposure. In the last year and a half or two years, at least again, I can speak in the United States and to a certain extent, Europe, I, I don't read the Arabic press, uh, there was a fair amount of media attention about cyberbullying, bullying and sexting. Again, much of it exaggerated much of it talking about the uh, epidemic of cyberbullying, even though there's never been any evidence that cyberbullying has reached epidemic proportions, uh, about suicide, even though suicides that are associated with bullying are extremely rare, and in every case, uh, there are other extenuating circumstances beyond bullying. And so when you educate the media, you have to be very, very careful that the media uh, is educated correctly, and you have to be aware of a common theme in media, which is, if it bleeds, it leads, which is, you will never see an article that says, 4,000 airplanes took off from Heathrow Airport yesterday and none of them crashed. Yeah. That will never make the front page of a newspaper. And so it's a very difficult thing to do because the media's business is to, exe not, is to exemplify the exception. And so every time there is a, horror, a tragic situation, 
such as that rare case where a girl in, in Facebook was sexually molested, I mean, in, in the UK was sexually molested, that becomes the obsession of the media. So uh, that's just my, my comment about your, your comment. Thank you. Okay, we're, we're running short of time, but um, what I'd like, if you wouldn't mind responding to that, and then we'll have a quick yeah. run down the row for really your future one. gazing yeah. thing, and then we'll, we'll wrap. So, yeah, my re response is actually, um, that we're not contradicting each other, and the Arab media has as a, uh, has covered it, but also very much like American media and others, only when they focus on a couple broke up because, you know, someone was committing adultery on Facebook, you know, that will be a big story. So you still need to reach out to that community to teach them more about the real uh, dangerous concerns that they should be looking at. And so it comes to the same thing. Okay, um, what I'd like to do if I could is just start along the line. I'll start with Fadl at the far end. What, what one piece of new technology or new change that you see on the horizon do you think we need to be thinking about and getting ready for? Um, you got the short straw, so you get the instant response. These guys can think about that answer. but. For instance, is it super fast broadband? Is it the availability of Arabic content? What do you reckon we need to be focusing upon? Uh, to be honest, I think most of the discussion is coming the on um, being a reactive uh, mode. Mm. You know, going the awareness after what happens. You know, mm. after the technology comes up, and, yep. uh, you know, and it's out in the market. So, my wish is that we get engaged earlier, not on the awareness point, but we. <coughs> talk to technology companies like Microsoft before, or Apple, or those kind of big uh, companies that before launching any product, like the, those iPads, those iPhones, I think it's, if there is a mandate, or if there is a discussion with them, just to understand those technologies and prepare some kind of safety guidelines for the, uh, you know, the kids, we're always... Yeah. Preempt rather than react. I think. Just as a follow-up to that, I mean, I think that uh, you know, with all the R and D, with all the research and development that companies put into this, and with all the discussion that companies make about how they're so concerned about this, we should ask the question. I guess you could ask me the question since I'm Microsoft. Do you actually do this? Do you actually think about the implications of what your next product is and how that will move the needle on this discussion of internet safety and security? I think that's a fair question for the consumer or for a state to ask. The other thing to take into account, I want to give you an example. I mean, disabled people, partially blind people, have organized themselves into a very powerful lobby. And when new phones come out, before they come out, they actually meet with the, with the designers to make sure that it has the appropriate, the appropriate criteria. This is why Windows 8 now is going to be much better for disabled people than it was before. And that's why the, the, the iPhone has been very advanced in that way, because they were told to do it. They were forced to do it. And that shows a proactive engagement by society. My technology piece is actually not IT, it's humans. How do we make better use of humans to be involved in the policing of this space, this interactive policing? Because I agree, afterwards is late. But you can see your children already. You know what's going on today. So how do we make sure that people can be part of that next, or be the, the next champion in the process of helping societies do a better job of protecting ourselves? I think we talk about things in a very passive way. And I think what we need to do is really say, hey, you know what? Someone's going to have to do this. And we need to find a way of rewarding champions. And if there is a technological approach, I think part of it's just based on the passion and the belief that you support people who are doing the right thing to make society right. I, I loved your comment, by the way. I think it shows that you're, you're grappling with these hard issues, but we haven't found the right response. So I, I want to add that. First of all, pressure groups from the beginning, get involved in the R&D cycle, but second of all, Let's find champions and let's reward them and let's drive them. If it's a national champion, ICT Qatar, if it's an individual, if it's open society, whatever it's going to be that will drive this, we need to find them. Okay. Yeah, well, actually, um, I'm really glad you said that because I'm a people person and I was going to... <laughs> Thank you. I was going to look at it. I didn't, you know, didn't really think about the uh, disab disabled... Uh, population, but I was thinking about illiterate uh, population, and, and there are many countries in the world, including Egypt, where there are many, many um, illiterate people who are you have these technologies, because we have 85 million um, mobile phone uh, 
users, um, but we, so there are a lot of illiterate people and how can we engage them um, with pressure groups? How can we engage them so these technologies are used to their benefit rather than misused because they just live in a world of lack of knowledge? I go back to almost where I started, I think. When countries like Pakistan, which have a huge element of people who live below the poverty line, but when a government announces, like they did last week, that they're going to launch a tablet, like a, an iPad, to address their market within the space of the next 12, 24 months, that device must be coming in somewhere near the 35 to $50. Okay? If that device hasn't got some inbuilt controls in it, okay, what you've done is you've opened up a market to, or opened up a world to people who are not equipped to use it, not equipped to enter into that world. And there is a role on the, on the R&D side very much so about talking between potential users, real users, and future users, and also about the policy side of things saying, yes, it's great to have all these devices out there, but what actually are we doing with them? And you know, unless we bring those two pieces together, then we just had a proliferation of, of a problem which we don't need to have because we've got the opportunity to nip it in the bud. And yes, we'll never stop it. There's no chance of stopping the problems as we see them. But we do have a means of curtailing them, controlling them, and educating from a very early age people in how best to use it and how best to protect themselves. And I fully support the idea you know, we are the biggest part of the problem. You know, people, unless they're well educated, unless they understand, unless they interact with the, the R&D side, with the developers, with the operators, will never ever control, if control is the right word, manage, maybe, don't know, the, the issues that we face. But also, I think we have another problem, which is the age divide that comes in. Younger and younger people getting access to technology. Their risk profile is changing very dramatically from when we were their age their, their concept of risk compared to our concept of risk is totally different. So if we're trying to impose our rules on them, not necessarily understanding the world in which they're living. So there is that piece there which, it's not necessarily future, it's a now issue, but unless we deal with it now, the future only becomes slightly more bleak. Thank you. Thank you.